Of all the events surrounding Apollo 11's landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969, my most vivid recollection is its unreal quality. Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chris. Today I have a very special video. I'm in Ithaca, New York, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Carl Sagan. If you guys don't know who Carl Sagan is, you probably should. He's probably impacted your life in some way, shape, or form, and you might not even know it. We're gonna learn a little bit about him today. We're gonna go on a tour. I'm with my friend Patrick Fish. He's a Carl Sagan aficionado. Behind me over here is Carl Sagan's house. I uh, used it more of a, a library from what I've learned. My dad taught me all about him. We would watch Cosmos together as I was growing up and we would learn about the stars and astronomy and science. So this means a lot to me. Let me introduce you to Patrick. Hi, I'm Patrick Fish with the Sagan Appreciation Society. And if you ever get a chance to visit Ithaca, New York, you really should. There's a lot of Carl Sagan history here. Uh, we're going to go and check out some of the Sagan and science-related sites around Ithaca. You should come with us. Okay. Is the sun considered part of the Milky Way galaxy? Sure. You are considered part of the Milky Way galaxy. Everything except other galaxies is part of the Milky Way galaxy. The sun is one star. There is a few hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. And around each star, maybe, there's a whole bunch of planets. On one of those planets is life, and one of the life forms on that planet is you. There is a, uh, a physical copy on one of the Mars probes with, uh, where Carl Sagan had left a message to the future uh, visitors and explorers and inhabitants of Mars, where he basically says, I'm Carl Sagan, and you know, I'm, I'm happy that somebody finally made it to Mars. And in this recording, you can actually hear the waterfalls in the background, and he actually talks about the waterfalls very briefly, just to kind of bring it to the, the listener's attention, pointing out that uh, waterfalls would be a rarity on Mars, but they're common here on Earth. Hi, I'm Carl Sagan, and this is a place where I often work in Ithaca, New York, near Cornell University. Maybe you can hear in the background a 200-foot uh, waterfall right nearby, which uh, is probably, I would guess, a rarity on Mars even in times of high technology. So this is Carl Sagan's public house. This is the house that people knew about. Um, he did move at some point after he became a, a public celebrity, uh, in part because of problems with fans showing up, but also uh, for his young son. There's an issue with the cliff, reportedly. They didn't want him going off the cliff. This would be where he would drive his car down? This, well, here and here. It's my understanding that they, there was a spot here. It's all overgrown, I'm sure, but there's a spot here, supposedly, we could park there. We could probably actually just look over and actually see. Yeah. Just, if you wanted to, we could just look over the edge and see what's there. We probably could. Let's find out, guys. Oh, it's all overgrown. Yeah. It's really overgrown now. Yeah, it's hard to see anything. We have 900 Stewart Ave. And this is where he would go and in. And he'd punch in right there to get in. And this is where Carl Sagan would walk up and down. So the thing was built in 1926. They sold it to the person who owned this house. So Robert Wilson lived here. He was a physicist. He spent a large portion of time in the 40s working on the Manhattan Project and the A-bomb and all that. There were a lot of physicists right. up here too. Right. In the meantime, he was renting this thing out to visiting Cornell faculty. Very few pictures of the residents exist. He built these bedrooms. Oh, so this is below... Um, this is on the... On the, um, the side? Just on the gorge side. So this is probably part of where the stories about the underground lab came from. Somebody was probably able to see that. This was deemed to be structurally unsound. So when Sagan bought it, he had to have, they had to demolish it. Oh, so it that explains really everything see it. Yeah, it's not there. It got, it got removed. I was wondering why we never saw it. So it sounds like you've been doing some research too on there. Well, because I live next door to right. it's like, you know, this, and... Have you had people come and ask before? Oh yeah, people think that Sagan lived here. Right, I started getting curious as to whether or not they may have also owned this. That's what we thought, just go to the source, ask the current property owner. They would likely know if it was It was the other way around. The person, Will, Robert Wilson owned this and he also, yeah. bought that thing because the Sphinx Head Society wanted to get out of it. They didn't want it anymore. For Part of your fame, Professor Sagan, 
apart from Johnny Carson making <laughs> making sport of your billions and billions and billions. Which I never said, by the way. You never said that? Never did I say it. And here he, said he, it. Here he made a career out of, uh, <laughs> out of his impressions. So there's a mythology that started that Carl Sagan had a secret underground lab and a secret underground tunnel that took him to work at Cornell the Space Sciences Building. But that's just not true. None of it's true. In fact, he just walked out his front door, crossed the bridge. On the other side of the bridge is where the trail that he took to go to work. And you can walk it anytime you want. Check it out. It's really nice. There's a fence there now. It wasn't there at the time. But if you're crafty, you can still access the water if you want. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. So he would have taken this trail uh, when he went to work up to Cornell and we can't go there because there's a detour right now but that's the trail that he most likely went up we're not sure if the parking lot here was there back in the 80s or not uh, but he also could have went that way right now I'm walking on the trail that Carl Sagan would have walked down uh, when he was coming home from work to go home and his house is right over there the earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Whales communicating across the oceans must have experienced greater and greater difficulties. 200 years ago, a typical distance that some whales could communicate across was uh, perhaps 10,000 kilometers. Today, on a typical day, the corresponding number is perhaps a few hundred kilometers. We have cut off the whales from themselves. Creatures which were freely communicating for tens of millions of years have now effectively been silenced. Did Carl Sagan eat dinner here? Let's investigate. So after Cosmos was released and Carl Sagan was widely known as a celebrity, the, the fret house that we're at now had offered him to come over, have some dinner. Now as it happened, the Sagans were experiencing some issues with vandalism and chicanery around the property and they suspected that maybe some drunken frat boys were involved. And um, anyway, when the frat, the, the frat boys uh, invited Sagan over for dinner, there was a misunderstanding. Currently his assistant, Shirley Arden, interpreted it as a request for a speaking engagement. And so she sent the fraternity uh, his, uh, what they called it, the, the speaker's fee. And so the boys here were very upset, very offended. They were just trying to invite Carl Sagan over and instead were being basically given a bill. And so they were upset. So what they did was they erected a huge sign made out of Christmas lights that said basically F.U. Sagan. And so when the Sagans got home one day, they saw it from across the gorge and uh, weren't too happy. Carl came over and uh, anyway, long story short, they came to uh, a friendly understanding. The issue was resolved. The sign was taken down, but of course it, it remains part of the, the Frit House legend and everybody's got a different story as to, to what the sign actually said. Obviously nobody that is at the Frit House actually ever saw the sign. So I'm guessing that we're standing exactly where the sign would have been because it's flat. It would have made more sense for them to have put the sign here than up there. Right. It would have made a lot yeah, more sense. you're right. Yeah. It's probably right, right up here or right they there. Right there. there was a pool table in here last I knew. So they would probably just come right out and set it right here. It's flat, it makes sense. And perfect visibility across the gorge. Oh, yeah. the pool table is still here, check it out. Imagine if this thing could talk, what it could tell us. <laughs> it's 60. This has been the year of the moon landing, actually. Oh, That's kind of cool, yeah. yeah. So basically said the house is pretty much a big library right now. We didn't get yeah. that on film. Study. And we've done worse than that. Because there persists, till this day, a traffic in the dead bodies of whales. There are humans who gratuitously hunt and slaughter whales and market the products for dog food or lipstick. Many nations understand why whale murder is monstrous. We use the word monster to describe an animal somehow different from us, somehow scary. But who's the more monstrous? The whales who ask only to be left alone to sing their rich and plaintive songs or the humans who set out to hunt them and destroy them and have brought many whale species close to the edge of extinction. We're at a little park across the ravine. There it is. Now, eating an apple may seem like a very simple thing, but it's not. 
In fact, if I consciously had to remember and direct all the chemical steps required to get energy out of food, I'd probably starve to death. And yet, even a bacterium can do anaerobic glycolysis. That's why apples rot. It's lunchtime for the bacteria. We just found Carl's house and it made us, you know, really get an appetite. It's like 90 degrees out here. We're sitting in the air conditioner right now. We're making a vegan tofurkey sandwich, the bologna style. Look at that. And we don't have any mustard here. We got some good planet, garlic and herb cheese. We got some spinach on there. What kind of bread we got? Organic something or another. There we go. And when you go to Canada, Pizza Pizza, I think, uses BioLife, and Pizza Nova uses um, Dea. Dea. Is it Dea or Dea? Dea. Dea, okay. Dea the Dead. We're going to see you at the next Sagan location. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people who never knew each other, citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. A book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. And this room is filled with magic. Ithaca is filled with Sagan-related history. You may go by a place and not even know it. This bridge right here is where they took the picture that is on the golden record on Voyager that's billions of miles from Earth. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. We have begun to contemplate our origins. Star stuff, pondering the stars. Oh. We're all made of star stuff. Some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return. And we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So the second planet walk is a scale model of the solar system. And this is the start, the center, the star, our sun. Now the size of this is something you want to keep in mind. It's about the size of a basketball, maybe a little bit larger. And as we proceed farther in the tour, the size of the sun will become kind of central to understanding the bigger picture here. But we'll get to that shortly. Um, Here's a cannon shooting a cannonball, which is interesting because this is kind of what gave people the idea that uh, if you followed the parabola far enough, you could maybe put something in orbit. We've got a clock a top, got a fire, we've also got a bat. The sun, which is right here, is spaced proportionally to the other obelisks down the walkway. This is, again, the sun. We're at Mercury. That dot that you can barely see, that is Mercury relative to the size of the sun. And with that in mind, you take a look how far away we are from the sun, you kind of get a real idea of just how big the solar system is just starting to get an idea. And uh, so anyway, this is Mercury. It's the closest planet to the sun. What's interesting about this is that the temperature gets up to 427 degrees Celsius. The reason why that's important is because, well, it'll become clearer as we head over to Venus, this planet is almost twice as far away from the sun as Mercury is. But yet, when you look at the temperature, you would expect that this to be about maybe around half the temperature that Mercury would be, seeing as it's twice as far away from the sun. If you look, you can actually see that it's about twice as far, far away. Well, the answer is gases, what we call greenhouse gases. In fact, around 1960, it was Carl Sagan. He was the first person to determine the temperature of Venus using um, a radar technique. And when we finally did land probes, or I should say the Soviet Union landed probes, they confirmed that the temperature that we, we uh, estimated by using uh, radar technology was in fact correct. But what's really informative about Venus is that it proves the concept that the composition of the planetary gases is going to affect how much heat you retain. A little bit of greenhouse gases is a good thing. Too much, a very bad thing. So when somebody doubts that climate change is real, all you have to do is compare the difference in temperatures between Mercury and Venus. And there's a reason why Venus is so much warmer than you'd expect. And it's because of the, the composition of so-called greenhouse gases. As we go to Earth, you can, you can kind of see we're not that far away from Venus, and uh, the temperature difference is significant, and that's because our
composition of our gases is different, but we're changing that because of human activity mostly. Okay, so now we're at the Earth obelisk. It took light from the sun about eight and a half to nine minutes to reach here. Um, that is the size of the Earth relative to the sun. And you can see here, this is supposed to be the moon. That shows you how far away humans have gotten from them. That's the farthest that humans have ever gotten away from their home planet. We've begun at last to wonder about our origins, star stuff, contemplating the stars, organized collections of 10 billion, billion, billion atoms, contemplating the evolution of matter, tracing that long path by which it arrived at consciousness here on the planet Earth and perhaps throughout the cosmos. So between Mars and Jupiter is the asteroid belt, and they actually have a real asteroid, something you would actually lay your hands on. And it's a high iron content, the magnet will stick to it. Um, you guys should come and touch the asteroid. So Pat pretty much just summed it up. I like to think about, that this is profound to me because this asteroid at one point was floating around in space for billions of years and I just happened to be alive while it's here on Earth. That's like a fraction of a fraction of time for this asteroid, but here I am, and it's been on Earth all my life and thousands of years before I was born. So come over here and touch a piece of history. Uh, when you come to Ithaca to do the Sagan Planet Tour, you definitely want to make a point of stopping in. The Autumn Leaves Bookstore has a space-themed, Star Trek-themed uh, cafe, and it's called Ten Forward, and uh, they have food from the future. There we go. Oh, there it is. There it is. Last perfect day on Earth. In our tenure on this planet, we've accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. But we've also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great soaring passionate intelligence, the clear tools for our continued survival and prosperity. You're all three summer interns for the Sagan Institute. Well, yeah. so we're in the RU program, which is the Research Institute. Research, Research experience for undergrads. For undergrads. Yep. So it's the Department of Astronomy. Mm -hmm. Can you <laughs> tell us what it's like working there? It's really cool. I no. mean, work we do is really interesting. It's specifically, a lot of us work on exoplanets, which are planets that orbit a star other than our sun. Um, so there's different concentrations of research. Some of us do modeling. Um, that's what the team I work on does. They model different planetary atmospheres. And then some people work on observations, so looking at actual data. So that's what I'm doing. That's what she does. Yeah. Do you guys find any hint of oxygen anywhere? Um, Neither of us are working on yeah. stuff that would, that would uh, help those uh, results. Yeah. I'm working on modeling, so I would model stellar spectra and look for potential oxygen, but it wouldn't be in actual exoplanets, it would be in planets we could potentially detect. Mm -hmm. Nice to know. Do you know yeah. where uh, Carl Sagan's office was? Yes, third floor. Third floor. Third floor. Third floor. Third floor. On yeah. the corner? Does the current occupant still bristle if visitors come to want to check no, it out? No, oh, no, she The current occupant is really good about that. Oh, like, it's Lisa Carlton Ager, the director of the Carl Sagan Institute. She's got his old office. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if Andrean arranged that. <laughs> yeah. And she's cool with like having people come and check it out or no? She, she encourages it. Yeah, yeah, she lets people Ooh. take photos in her office. Oh, that's she's really cool. good about it. Yeah. Because the previous occupant okay. was very proprietary. He kept the door closed. He didn't want it known that um, that it was Carl's old office. Well, we'd be able to get in there. But now yeah, there's so no sign for it. So right, exactly. you can walk right by yeah. it. The Voyager know. spacecraft right at the corner is like the only hint. Yeah, that's the only hint. That, <laughs> is there any other cool things you can tell us about Carl that most people probably don't know? His wife is really cool too. A lot of people yeah. don't know that, um, but his his last wife uh, also made a lot of contributions to astrobiology, and so. Yeah. That's how the Carl Sagan Institute became named after him. Was it through an endowment, right? I believe um, so. Because let's face it, Carl Sagan was the biggest raw Cornell has ever had. So yeah, and people would come here just because like this is where Carl is. We made our way in. Did, did you press the button to go up? That's a, that's uh, third floor. Answer, third floor, we're going to see Carl Sagan's office. We can only stay real quick because we have run out of time. I need to be back in Syracuse. Okay, so we are in. The, well, we're in the third floor of the Space Sciences Building, Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. And Carl's office is right there, or his old office is right there, but it's now the home of uh, Carl, the Carl Sagan Institute. And uh, he's at Kaltenegger, his uh, main office there. This is it. 
Oh, look, there's Frank Drake. That must have been taken when he was here a couple years ago for the uh, the Golden Record event. This is the restroom Carl used. Now, is that is that his fingerprint? No, well, it, the reference is they're looking for fingerprints of life, hints of life. Oh, nice. Good to know. And then... I don't think that's his actually That would be... That's actually a good question. Who's... Uh, that looks like a mirror. That was Carl's office. This is where he worked every day that he was at the college when he wasn't traveling. Our loyalties are to the species and the planet. We speak for Earth. Our obligation to survive and flourish is owed not just to ourselves, but also to that cosmos ancient and vast from which we spring. So we are at the end of our tour. We're at Carl Sagan's grave. Um, as you can see, born November 9th, 1934, and died December 20th, 1996. Um, the solstice, by the way, the night before solstice, the shortest day of the year, least light. Carl was the, the, the candle in the dark, light went out, solstice came. Very appropriate. I want to thank you for bringing us on this tour. And do you have any um, last things you want to say in this video? Absolutely. Uh, the thing about Carl, everyone knows about his science advocacy and, and his television show Cosmos. Um, but probably what I think is the most important thing that he's ever done is that he, he was absolutely crucial in ending the nuclear proliferation and the saber rattling between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the 80s. Reagan's camp hated him because Carl was critical of the SDI program, which would have destabilized the precarious balance of power between the Soviet Union and the U.S. And when Carl started talking about things like um, nuclear winter and was able to get Soviet scientists to corroborate that, it gave people on both sides of the ocean uh, reason to step back and realize that it was really pointless to keep trying to build more and more nuclear weapons. And uh, ultimately, uh, long story short, because of Carl parlaying his science credibility and his science celebrity into the, uh, the arena of, of public politics, it convinced the, the American public to change their mind and the Soviet public to change their mind and the leadership. It was very much from a grassroots up. The, the leaders were the ones that were dragged into changing their minds about the, the nuclear balance of terror that we had then. And in fact, uh, Gorbachev's uh, advisor said that their policy was entirely based on, on Sagan's worldview. So we know that he absolutely made it possible for us to have the SALT II agreement, which was reached in Reykjavik, uh, Iceland, between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, all of this uh, relates back to, or, or is attributable to, the changes that Carl Sagan brought to the body politic and to the public understanding of, of uh, the situation that we were putting ourselves in by building more and more nuclear weapons. People that weren't born then don't remember, they don't know what it was like to, every couple of weeks there was a conflict with the Soviet Union in 1983. They shot down one of our passenger planes, killing a congressman, it was a KEL Flight 007. Half the world thought we were gonna end up in a nuclear war because of that. Um, if you didn't live through it, you're lucky, but this is the guy that helped bring us out of that era. And uh, unfortunately, people don't know that uh, that things change because of him. They just know the TV show. They don't know the other things they do. So this is Leo Zillard. Leo was a scientist who first conceptualized the idea of a nuclear chain reaction. Um, he was actually inspired by H.G. Wells. Anyway, unfortunately, this allowed us to uh, develop nuclear weapons. People like to attribute it to Einstein's E equals MC squared, but that was just kind of the mathematics of it. He actually came up with the idea of how you could physically do it and so kicked off the nuclear arms race. So once he saw what it could do in World War II, um, he spent the rest of his life fighting the nuclear arms race like Carl Sagan. So it's kind of an interesting bookend. You have a man here who is arguably responsible for beginning the nuclear arms race and Carl Sagan buried just a few meters away who was instrumental in bringing the nuclear arms race to an end. One of the other things that Carl was known for was his advocacy of free speech. Uh, there was an animal rights group on the Cornell campus. The Cornell University really wanted to have it shut down. They weren't happy with it being there. And they made it clear to anybody that would dare be the, 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 the club advisor that this is going to jeopardize your career. And Carl Sagan, in large part because of uh, people like his young protege, Peter Wilson, convinced him to take on that leadership role and become the faculty advisor for the Cornell students for the ethical treatment of animals. And if he had not done that, the school would have been able to close down the club. 
uh, Carl Sagan was the only one on campus that had the spine to step up and say, I'm going to get involved in this and I'm not going to let the school just arbitrarily say we don't want certain kinds of viewpoints on the campus. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. For me, this was a, a meaningful tour. As I said, I grew up learning about Carl Sagan, so being here where, where he actually worked and where he walked around was pretty amazing to see some of these places. Uh, I hope you guys liked the video. As I said, give me a thumbs up if you did. Don't forget to subscribe, survive. Hit that little uh, bell so you don't miss notifications. I'll see you guys next time. For the first time, we have the power to decide the fate of our planet and ourselves. This is a time of great danger, but our species is young and curious and brave. It shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. I believe our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky.